Namaste and a warm welcome to yet another event from the Royal Photographic Society India chapter and Circle of Confusion Mumbai. I'm your host and moderator Rajan Nambwana. A warm welcome to our distinguished audience from several countries and several continents. Our guest today, Anastasia, is an accomplished wedding and landscape photographer. She's also an environmentalist and humanitarian. She has been honored to receive over 60 prestigious international photographic awards, both for her portrait and landscape work and named as one of the top photographers in the world by International Wedding Photographer of the Year and Epson International Photographic Awards. In 2018, Anna became Fujifilm Global Ambassador and is using Fujifilm photographic gear for her work. Her work has featured in several magazines, including Vogue, Magnolia Roche, Wedding Sparrow, Belle Lumiere, National Geographic, CNN, WWF, The Guardian, Fuji Love, LA, Corriere della Sera, Spiegel, Getty Magazine, and so and so. She has been inseparable from the camera for the last 25 years. Over the last year, uh, months, as and when, I had the pleasure to invite a guest to this platform. I'm really surprised and astonished that they all have done so much in their life. Um, it's amazing that our guest today is another case to study and to hear about. She did her graduation or let, let's say dual graduation under a full scholarship of Moscow University a Bachelor of Arts in International Journalism, at the same time, a Bachelor of Arts in Russian Spanish Interpreter. She continued her education as one of the Chilean universities, where again she received a scholarship, studied international relation and diplomacy with the dream of working at the United Nations. She graduated with distinctions as a master in international relations, majoring in UN Peacekeeping, uh, peacekeeping operations. During her first year, she applied as an intern at UN headquarters in Santiago, and she was accepted and kept working for next seven years as a program officer. She's fluent in English, Russian, Spanish, Italian, and French. Her travel all over the world due to United Nations job, made her a photographer, or more or less made her become a photographer, if I believe so. And she loves and uses her story to inspire other women, creatives, photographers to fight for their dreams and to believe in themselves. A love for nature and protection for environment and wildlife has become an underlying message for our landscape and portrait work. Ladies and gentlemen, in today's session, I will be taking questions in between the two sessions that she's going to, the first session is going to be landscape. The second one is about her wedding photography. And if you have any questions, please be so kind to have these questions come to the chat box. I, I humbly request all of you to remain muted on your video and audio during the course of the entire meeting. Let's welcome ladies and gentlemen, Miss Anastasia. Hello, good evening to you, Anna. And thank you for letting, allowing me to call you Anna. Uh, it's amazing that with a full bright flying career as you and diplomat, what's drawn you into your photography? I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what you are doing with all the qualifications and how you have come to become a photographer. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you allow me, Rajan, I mean, first of all, thank you so much for having me today and thanks everyone for choosing to spend um, your time with us. Um, I'm very excited to have you all uh, here. 
So Rajan, if you allow me, I might just um, start a little slideshow with my landscape work while I'm telling a little bit uh, about my story, just so it's not my boring face um, sure. <laughs> on the screen, yes. if that's okay. I, I will. You have the screen sharing, so please go ahead. Yeah, so I will just give me one second. Start this. Just bear with me a second. Okay, sure. Okay, please tell me if you can see my screen, Rajan. Yes, I can. It's clear and good. Perfect. Okay. So we're just going to let it do its thing. Hopefully. Yep. So while while I'm telling a little bit about myself, you guys can, can see a little bit of my landscape work. Um, and then I guess we'll we'll stop at some photographs later on and I'll, I'll tell you some stories. So um, my passion for photography started uh, actually with my love for nature. Um, and I remember that I was about seven years old and I was always observing little things like how the light is falling, um, color shifts, you know, all these little things. And I just couldn't stop, you know, admiring how how beautiful everything was. And I just wanted to, you know, I was just feeling so much. So I just wanted to ca capture everything um, and just like stop this moment. So in my family, nobody actually owned a, a photo camera. Nobody knew how to use it. Nobody could teach me. So, and, and I actually never saw a photograph of anything apart from like some old family photos in my life. So this passion came from literally nowhere. Um, and, um, and I started asking my parents for a photo camera. Um, and, you know, it, it took a couple of years. So one, one day, so I was about um, 11. So my, my, my parents sent me to London to like on a, on a school exchange program. And they gave me a pocket money, which was 55 pounds from my memory. So pretty much the first day as we arrived, I went to a store. And I spent pretty much all of it on a photo camera, which is this one. I still have it. It's a Kodak, Kodak film camera. Um, I still I still hold it dear. And then since then, I, I basically started taking photos, and uh, photography became a creative outlet for me. And uh, when I was sixteen, um, I started studying journalism. And the first year, we had. Uh, we had for photography, photojournalism, and um, my professor, so he asked us to bring some photographs that we've taken just to see obviously what our vision is, what we like doing and what, what's interesting to us. And, and I brought some photos of um, sunsets and um, basically sun related series and like landscapes. And um, he really liked them. And he, he said, I can I hold these photos a little bit I said like are you sure uh, no, no problem at all so it turns out he actually entered my photos into um, Moscow Biennale photo competition without me knowing about it and I ended up winning it so he told me you go to this to the ceremony um, I'm like why would I go there and like I'm gonna embarrass myself and like all this you know serious photographers there with good cameras and everything and then, and, and I was 16 at the time, or 17, you know, and then uh, they suddenly announced my name as a winner of the landscape um, category for, for the sunset, sunset series. And, um, and I basically, I, 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 like, I suddenly realized that it doesn't matter if you have a fancy camera or a basic camera like like this Kodak that I have. That's why I sort of keep it because it's just a reminder that the person that is behind the camera that is important. And through my um, through my work, I 
I try to inspire people to believe in themselves and not to think that they need specific camera, very expensive camera, um, or have to focus just on the technical aspect of photography to achieve certain photographs and, and to basically achieve their dreams. Um, then after uni, um, well, while I was studying, I kind of wanted to be photojournalist. I wanted to travel. Um, I wanted to dedicate my, my life to, you know, saving the world and um, being, you know, involved in um, hotspots. My parents were very against it. So they said, please pick something that is, you know, safer and kind of maybe more in the office. Um, and one of my um, professors in the uni, so he was uh, working for UNESCO in Paris for pretty much majority of his life. Um, and he made me fall in love with the United Nations, what they stood for. And I felt like, well, this probably is my calling. So I just, um, as um, Rajan, as you, as you mentioned already, I, I decided, well, let's go somewhere far away, <laughs> as far from home as possible, see the other side of the world, experience new things, got accepted to, um, to the University of Santiago. And then the first, first year, I basically just, knocked the door of UN and said, please take me. I'm really passionate about it. And they believed me. And they took me and, you know, there I stayed until um, I got an opportunity to move to Australia. And um, once I moved to Australia, I basically started focusing more on, on the landscape photography and, and then later became Nisi ambassador and Fujifilm X photographer. And um, 10 years I have been living in Australia. And in in the beginning, um, another thing when I was kind of contemplating what sort of things I should do with my life after after my bachelor degree, and was was thinking like, well, if I if I become a photographer, I kind of was feeling that I'm not um, I'm not mature and experienced enough to produce work that can have depth. And I kind of was living with that feeling. And then once I came to Australia and you know, certain life experiences and certain things that obviously I learned and, and worked for in, in UN, um, gave me a very different perspective on life, on human relationships, on nature, on different issues and, and things like that. So I realized that I, I was ready. And later on, I came across this quote by, Ans by Ansel Adams, um, who said that you don't make a photograph just with the camera, you bring to the act of photography, all the pictures you have seen, the books you have read, the music you have heard, the people you have loved. And I, in, and I suddenly remembered myself, you know, being 20 years old when I graduated. And I was thinking, well, this is why, because I was not ready. And now, because I've seen so many things, now I can actually bring all these things that I've seen and experienced to, to the work that I can produce, being in landscape and wedding photographer. And I think that reflects a lot in my work. So yeah, that's, uh, that's how it all started, <laughs> developed. Amazing. Um, uh... Moving from landscape to wedding photography, that remains a little bit of a mystery for, for us or for me <laughs> rather. <laughs> well, the story was um, pretty simple. I had, um, I had friends uh, actually from India um, living here in Australia. So they had a white wedding, um, well, so-called white, white wedding because the, uh, let's say cultural weddings um, sometimes here consist of two weddings. So one would be traditional, the second one would be white wedding. Um, sometimes those weddings, they happen um, overseas, you know, the traditional part of it. And then the, the white part happens in Australia. Sometimes couples have it both in Australia. Uh, so in this case, the Indian wedding was in, in India. And then they decided to have a wedding in Australia, like a, a very small thing. So they said like, well, we'll have your wedding, we'll, we'll have your landscape photos. I, I did work as a photojournalist when I was in uni, uh, more of it as an experience, but you know, that, that's pretty much as close as I got to photographing people like ever, um, because I'm not really a people photographer or I haven't been. 
landscape was the only thing. So they said, okay, can you photograph our wedding? Do you have like all the equipment and everything? Um, I'm sure you're gonna do a good job, like we trust you. And, and I said like, well guys, yeah, I've never photographed the wedding before, like at your own risk, I'd love to, but you know, it, it's, um, it's not something I, I, I have experienced since obviously. And um, I've done it and I loved it. <laughs> and they really loved the photos. And I guess it, to it, it comes the, the philosophy that I have about photography in general, that I really care about the result. I really care about people that I photograph. Uh, I care about everything that I do and I'm, I'm very passionate about it. Um, and I work with a lot of integrity and I didn't want to be that experience to be about me you know, trying to maybe achieve some images for my portfolio or anything like that. I think I'm more just listening to them and produce the images that they that they wanted. Um, and after that, some people saw my work. Um, that was 2013. Um, they saw my work and they said they, they started basically slowly booking me. And I thought, well, let's just launch um, a proper proper official company, uh, which I called Serenity Photography. Um, I guess the name also came from my landscape photography because I, I like everything serene and I, I chase serenity. Um, so that's, that's pretty much how wedding photography started. And since that I've been doing both uh, at the same time. So uh, do you want to run through your presentation uh, yeah. Start with, yeah thank you yep so I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna focus on some of the landscape photography before we jump onto onto wedding um, and let's see so the way how I tell how I take images is I'm telling a story. So I'm gonna, and, and I try to do different things uh, with the image. So it, it kind of looks more interesting um, and there is more to it. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about a few images and my like story behind it. And then um, if you guys have any questions on you obviously can, can ask later. So this, um, this image, for example, was taken in Invercargo, which is the, the very south point of New Zealand. And the winds um, in that area are absolutely insane. Like it, you literally can't even stand um, sometimes properly because the wind is just moving you. So I wanted to really be able to capture that environment, that scene um, somehow. And it's, um, and I came across a few trees. So the, the thing is that like they actually, so this is an old tree uh, growing around the shed. Um, so the tree actually looks like this at all times. So it's not moved by wind, but because it's always that windy, it just grew in this shape. So this is the shape of the tree. And it just like, and I was thinking like, well, this is, this is, the tree that tells the story of where it was born, the conditions it lives in, um, and basically that's um, that's how I captured it. Uh, let's see next one. So this um, Anna, just one minute. Yeah, yeah. To be really honest, I thought that this tree had already fallen. I mean, you know, I, mm -hmm. I just couldn't believe that it was born this way. Amazing. Absolutely yes, yes. amazing story. It oh. And it is more of a photojournalistic um, yes, I guess, um, a landscape shot. And I, I, as a photographer, I always try to preserve how things are, even if I'm um, showing a different perspective or different way of photographing something, I, I always try to stay true to, to what I see. I don't like this, uh, you know, crazy manipulations that some photographers do or you know, twisting the reality too much. Um, so very limited post-process in my, in my work usually. Fantastic. Um, this is a, like a little, a little hut that is, um, if you see on the very top of the mountain, so this is actually a glacier in, in New Zealand where I arrived by helicopter. So the, not too much of a story here, but, you know, if you just take a photograph of, um, 
you know, mountain, snow, you know, there's not too much, too much to it of an interest. But then you offer here to a viewer a little hut on top of it. And then immediately whoever sees this image starts thinking, who lives in this hut? How did they get there? What's the story to it? Like, what are they doing? And, and this, like, suddenly your viewer becomes very interested and their mind becomes more, starts wondering um, about the photograph. So immediately it becomes more interesting. I'm just gonna switch to the next one. Now, in, in the, the, this is a, a famous Wanaka tree in New Zealand um, as well. And I photographed uh, a plenty of images and, I've, and I have been with a group of photographers there as well. Um, I photographed uh, a, a number of images that is uh, you know, quite famous just with the mountain view and um, in color, obviously. Um, but if you arrive to this location, which I did like before anybody else, very, very early, you can actually see birds sitting on the tree. I don't know why they hang out there. <laughs> they might have their morning meetings. Um, but I, I was, uh, and, and it's pretty much, uh, I don't know, maybe half an hour and they're gone. So the next morning, um, I thought like, well, the location doesn't tell the story as much, but the birds do. Uh, so they were very interesting to me. Um, so I decided to come next day uh, very early. I was by myself and, and capture more of a close up shot just of the detail from a different angle that it is usually photographed and capturing those birds just to tell the story about it as well. And again, when the viewer sees it, um, they start thinking um, about these birds, you know, what birds are they and the, what the trees and the water, you know, on all sorts of things. Let's move to the next one. Um, so they, this shot um, is of Mioto, Iowa, which is a uh, wedding rocks um, in Japan. So I won first place in Carolyn Mitchum Award and Epson Panoi Awards for this shot. And um, the, the rocks, um, they symbolize husband and wife. So the bigger, bigger rock is husband and smaller rock is wife. Um, and many Japanese couples uh, come to this um, to these rocks to ask blessing for their for their marriage. And usually, this uh, these rocks are photographed from a different angle, uh, with the rising sun behind them, or let's say between them, uh, which is quite famous. And I had a different vision uh, to photograph this at sunset, at a very precise five minutes when the the rope is actually lit by the sun and then to to contrast with like the, to contrast the long exposure and smooth water uh, with the harshness of the rocks and for basically to to represent um, to represent with my image the strength and the union of two people thrown into life together and they have to make it uh, for stormy days through calm days and and the bigger rock shelters the smaller rock uh, from the winds of the open sea. Um, and the smaller rock gets fully exposed at the low tide, showing um, the husband's rock um, a stable ground beneath them. And they're both beautiful uh, on their own and they're beautiful together, creating a perfect harmony. And just like the marriage of two people com complementing each other, become one without losing their own identity. So that image, um, that image is um, is telling a story, um, not just being a pretty picture of, of a location. So that's that's really important to to bring that to photography. Here's a, a picture in, in in Patagonia. So it took me <laughs> it took me a couple of hours to actually get this shot because um, again this was a this was a very pretty scenery uh, that I encountered, although like it was very windy, it was getting very cloudy and um, all photographers that were there that were waiting for a pretty sunset with like uh, beautiful colors and everything. So they, um, they left because it was just um, boring to them. But to me, it was very realistic because um, it actually represented how conditions usually are and it's constantly changing the wind and everything. Um, 
and at the same time i was i was thinking like well without without a natural element it is it is not as interesting um and then i noticed there were condors flying above above the 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 the, the mountain um because they're trying to hunt for lemons so again um condors flying over there just telling it it is telling the story of of the life of the natural environment uh, over there, um, and I thought it would be would be more interesting to to show it as a, as a story like that. Um, this is another one from Patagonia. Um, so if you guys know the story, um, Patagonian forest has been burned um, some time ago, um, very badly by one of the of the tourists it was an accident but it was all burned so all the beautiful trees became black and and dead so when you arrive uh, to one of the locations in in Torres del Paine National Park so all you can see is just dead trees there is nothing there and then I saw and 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 I, I took a I took a number of pictures in that location but then I saw this tree and it sort of represented life to me because it kind of like is a heart shaped. Uh, it's like a tree of life. So I thought, well, if I, I thought that this, this location of this, it had hope, uh, you know, because things starting to, you know, come back to life over there. As you can see, there's a grass that is uh, green now before it was black. So that, that element of, um, of this tree in, in, in the hard shape basically um, made made the story to me more more true to to the to my hopes I guess about the future of this location. Um, this is um, this was a very cool story. So this is Argentinian part of Patagonia. So usually Usually it's photographed in sunrise and sunset. Um, and I actually ventured there at night. And as you can imagine at night, there is not like, basically what you can do at night is you can photograph um, astrophotography at night, um, or it's gonna be, you know, pitch, pitch black and it's just, you know, the stars and everything. So on that day, it was a full moon, a pretty much full moon. And I was thinking that why not, why not to try something different and photograph and do the astrophotography uh, with the full moon, which is the biggest moon known in astrophotography, anybody would tell you. But the moon was actually rising and it was behind me, so it was low. And I was thinking, let's um, let's hike over there at night. And I was sleeping there on, on the glacier in the tent for a few nights. So it was just a, um, a stroll from my tent um, in between some pumas wandering around, which was a little bit <laughs> scary, but made through that um, and I arrived to this lake um, and I saw how obviously the peaks of the mountain they're covered with, with snow. So they immediately were lit up by the rising moon while still giving, um, you know, I can still see the stars and everything. So it was just kind of thinking, you know, one of those shots when you, you, you can think outside of the box instead of, um, you, you, you appeared in a location at a certain time that you obviously can't change um, if it's a full moon or not. And then you just say, well, I can't do astrophotography because it's a full moon. You know, you can still make it work. You can still make it interesting and, and make it work in your favor. Anna, uh, if I may interrupt you. That's for sure. Uh, how long, uh, I mean, what was the exposure that you had to apply because even with a little bit of knowledge of photography there, I, I thought it was a daytime shot. <laughs> um, usually with the, obviously with the astrophotography, you try to stay maybe within 20 seconds, just so the stars are not moving too much. And obviously depending on the capabilities of the camera that you're using, then you can um, work with the shadow detail, highlight detail, you know, you kind of have to know your camera. Um, this one from my memory was actually a few seconds exposure, just because the, the, the moon was so bright that it literally looks like it was a day. Um, and this is pretty much how it looked like when I saw it, when you climb up the hill and you just, um, 
see this beauty. Uh, I mean, I was just overwhelmed. <laughs> so. Thank you. Uh, and the next one, yep. I gonna, so this is another example of what can be done differently as well. So this was shot, um, an astro shot as well, but at sunrise. So obviously you can't photograph at sunrise, but this was just before the sunrise, but because the mountains are so high, before you see the sun and before the sun hits the ground, it hits the tops of the mountain, obviously creating this um, different scenery, um, you know, with the, with the color and, and the whole vibrance of it while you still have stars, as you can see, um, they are visible in the background. So this was 30 seconds, if you, if you must know, Rajan. Thank you. Um, wow. this was, this was a very, um, this was a very cool adventure. This is south of Australia. This, this is called a camel rock. And, um, basically what I wanted to do, I wanted to photograph, um, I wanted to do an astro, take an astro shot. So when you photograph astro, it's obviously, um, you know, it has to be interesting, whatever you're doing there, um, with your foreground. Because, you know, on its own, um, just the Milky Way, the sky, you know, it's not, not quite interesting. So I decided to experiment with, uh, first of all, with my location, with composition and, and, and position of where I ventured, uh, what to have on the foreground. And also I've been doing light painting with my torch. So I've done quite a bit of experimenting of um, basically litting up the rock, the camel rock, which is actually a fair bit away. Um, and then illuminating the, the foreground as well, because when the water comes to, to these rocks that you can see in the foreground, it splashes and obviously water um, reflects the light. It, not, it doesn't subtract light like the rocks do. So it will create you know, a more interesting um, contrast in color and obviously make the shot interesting. And I spent hours there, um, cold, it was very cold <laughs> over there. Like as, as, as usually, you know, photographs can't be achieved, uh, you know, just popping off a tourist bus in a, you know, comfortable location and the lookout and there you go, you know, it's always some sort of sacrifice that has to happen. Um, and, um, and then to my, um, to my surprise, as I was taking the shot. So you see on the blue, a blue glow on the right hand side. So that's actually bioluminescence. So I've never, I've never seen bioluminescence in my life. And when I was, uh, when I was taking this shot and I was like eliminating the, the water in the front, I saw like little sparkles kind of basically spark, sparkling just for a second and then fading away and I was like well, what is it like it looks very weird and then I realized that's actually bioluminescence so close to me because of the rocks you can't see it but then far away there was like more a bigger concentration of them so this whole shot came together um nicely I think and and I'm quite proud of it just not just being an astro shot but having so many elements of nature again you know location and just um Make make the view wonder different different aspects of it and, and thinking that what's going on here, and uh, that's probably what you want from your viewer to, to to happen. You want them to to stay with your photograph and and think about it rather than just flip to next. Anna, this is an absolutely stunning shot. Absolutely stunning. Thank you. Um, I'm inclined to ask you some questions if you don't mind. Yeah, is this a single shot or it's a composite shot or uh, you you mentioned about painting with the light so how long uh, was the exposure and what kind of light would you need because the rocks may be in too far away distance and is it enough to light it up or ISO and so on so if you can enlighten in the minimum way uh, what you did uh, it, it surely will educate uh, the participants here because it's absolutely, you know, the most difficult thing that I, I find in photography 
is to bring some details in shadows rather than anywhere else. And you've done that job absolutely fantastically. Thank you, Rajan. So, drum roll, <laughs> this is a single shot. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because this is what I do. Um, and um, I don't, like I mentioned before, I don't really like manipulation um, with the photographs. And um, it took me a couple of hours to experiment with this shot to make it right. And I guess this is one of those things that you just have to do as a photographer because, um, so the exposure was uh, probably about cars and I saw um, the, the exposure time was probably 20 seconds. Um, I, don't, I don't have the exit data in front of me, but that's just from, from my memory. Just as you would normally take your astro, astro shot um, as a long exposure. <laughs> but then, um, we'll, and, and the light, so the, the only light that I'm using is, is basically a head torch um, that I usually hike with. Um, that any photographer, any landscape photographer should obviously have in their kit. And uh, because you're doing, um, say, 20 second exposure, and the way how I was, um, how I said earlier that dark rock obviously is not going to be as reflective to the light as the water would be, because the water becomes white, as you can see. So basically, you need to, to find a balance between illuminating the back background, which is the, the camel rock here and the foreground. But because um, obviously I had one light and if, you, if you're not careful, you're basically overexposing your foreground or you aren't exposing your background. So it's, it's all about fi finding that balance. And because I had 20 seconds to play with, so I basically shined the light first during those 20 second exposure, I shined the light on the on the further away rock, on the camel rock, made sure that it was long enough there, so probably 10 seconds or maybe a little bit more. And then just, just before um, it was end of 20 seconds, um, so I would say maybe three second maximum, um, I just paint and basically it's like you're doing with your brush with this light slowly from side to side on your foreground. So you um, and, and, and that sort of ma made this made this possible, if that makes sense. Masterpiece, absolute masterpiece. <laughs> Thanks, Rajan. Has has been awarded with, <laughs> with a few awards. Um, and um, the patients, patients paid off for sure on that one. It, it well deserves, it well deserves. Um, then I wanna show just um, two, two images very quickly that were taken from exactly same uh, location at exactly same time. Um, it's, um, it's this one and this one. And as you can see, you know, as a photographer, I'm just gonna quickly go back um, and then go here. And as a photographer, you, you make your photograph, you know, you're in control of what you want to achieve creatively. And here, for example, it's a very long exposure in this one and creates completely different um, mode to the image where um, this one is more of a landscape shot. So anybody from any location can always experiment and um, take some interesting pictures. Um, Another one, so back to like storytelling. So I've taken the shot on a, I, I actually wanted to photograph, um, and it's, uh, we're gonna get in a, in a topic of um, how to not to give up as a landscape photographer because it can be frustrating because obviously nature is not something you can control and you just have to work with uh, whatever comes your way. And um, I took the shot, um, on a lake here in, in, in Queensland while expecting a very nice sunrise. Um, sunrise did happen. However, it was so foggy, uh, nothing, nothing could be seen. And uh, some photographers that were um, 
you know, that, that came to that location, they basically just, you know, packed and left because usually that's what people do. Um, and I usually try to experiment a little bit more, stay at the location, see maybe there is something more interesting that can be, can be achieved. And um, this is basically how, how it happened. However, as, as human beings, we read information from left to right. So what I did was flip, flicking this picture from left to right. That was my only manipulation with that. That also, also had some awards um, a couple of years ago. And, that, and, and those little things um, on the water, those actually also little ducks. Um, they were just slowly floating in, in the fog. And that immediately you know, tells you the story of the location with the fog and obviously the bird flying from left to right instead of right to left immediately changes the whole dynamic of how you perceive the image. Um, this was um, so another story. So uh, this this was in um, this this are my Iraqi boulders in New Zealand, quite famous location. And um, on that day, I was very very lucky to get this uh, spectacular sunrise. Um, and um, again, trying to to play with the with the water movement, and you know, just trying to capture something um, that wouldn't be just. Um, very long exposure, very smooth water. I wanted to show some dynamic of it. And then a couple of years later, I came back over there and um, for, for the sunrise, hoping I could get um, another beautiful shot. And um, it was raining. Uh, so it was very gloomy. So there was, you know, no blue sky, no sunrise, obviously with beautiful colors. So other photographers who were at the beach at the same time, they, you know, pop, pop their head and they're like, no, it's not, not good enough and let's just leave. So they left and I stayed as, <laughs> as I usually do, as you already realize. And I took this shot. So, and I, and that's because you have to, and I mean, I, I really love it because I, I adore black and white photography. Um, something I specialize in, which is weird for landscape photographer. But you know, for to me, it was always um, it, to me it was always about you know s trying to see things differently, and trying to to make work what nature gives you. And um, and basically, I was thinking. Well, obviously, you know, it was gloomy. It was raining, so I thought, well, let's just uh, create a long exposure and make it in black and white and it's going to be beautiful image different from the same location and you know somebody who would have have given up <laughs> on this shot on this spot already you know and I left with a um, with a picture and this is our last one so this is another um, another story so this is Torres del Paine, Paine in Patagonia and again, it was it was sunset time. Uh, myself and a few photographers. It was raining uh, very badly, so clouds were moving. Uh, and and Patagonia is very very windy, so clouds move just insanely quick. And probably it was 50, 60 kilometers per hour wind. So you literally can't even stand, you know, with your tripod with the camera. I had to hide behind little shrub and hold myself to it. So it's it, it's very very special location for photography, I must say. And because it was, you know, this kind of weather, you know, other photographers, they said, well, there's nothing, you know, happening because it's, there's no sunset, there's nothing to wait here for. And um, they basically left um, with all their gear. And I thought, let's just hope that something will happen because I know that behind those clouds, sunset is happening. And something is happening with those mountains. You know, there is some color and everything. And um, and as you can see, there was a basically a split couple of seconds when clouds just open up enough, and then I just saw that the, that element of the mountain. And I do, and this is obviously it's a huge mountain, but I do love photographing landscape as a not just um, as a wide angle. I like sort of tighter, tighter shots because it makes you appreciate the different details of, of the landscape. 
So that's um, that's it for for the landscape. So yeah. Anna, I would like to say that your studies in photojournalism show strongly in the narratives or the stories that you have behind the uh, landscapes. And I'm sure that it also will carry to the wedding. And uh, what I see in landscape that I do a bit of landscape photography is that you have the classic landscape photography and you also have uh, what we call as uh, minimalism in landscape photography. You have the mix of two. Um, I'm wondering, were there uh, some mentors to take pictures in minimalism? For example, there, there are a few names and also uh, one that comes from Japan. So what influenced you to, to pursue some minimalism in your landscape photography? Um, well, to be honest, that I did, I never had an influence um, as I was photographing. Um, no, basically, none of my portrait work or landscape work has been influenced by anyone, um, especially you know through, throughout life. Later, I I kind of started studying you know different photographers like Ansel Adams and you know seeing how. But, but after I created my images and just seeing how, like, for example, his philosophy and his images resonate with mine. Uh, but in the beginning, it has always been um, an experiment to, you know, just, you know, certain vision that I had of, of different things and, and just trying to experiment and try to interpret that vision as a painter would through the photography. Um, and try to bring it to life. And obviously, you know, learning um, via trial and error the technique, because I would do one, take a few shots, you know, it's not gonna work. You, you start thinking um, how I can, how can I make it work? Sometimes you, you miss the opportunity and you <coughs> obviously disappointed, but um, next time you do it right. So it has been a process, a learning, learning curve. Um, but I, I'm proud of what I've done so far. And, and obviously there's still so much more to, you know, to, to learn and, and to try. And there's so many um, different locations that I really want to photograph for the last couple of years that I, <laughs> I was just not able to get to, hopefully <laughs> soon. Uh, I mean, is this, uh, you have been on, uh, Fujifilm 100 megapixel, 100 uh, since a couple of years now. Um, is this uh, part of that or is it before that? There's a question uh, uh, before the Fujifilm, which gear were you using and if these pictures are coming from that gear? Um, so, the majority, so I have been using Pentax 645Z. So, first of all, I'm using medium format. Um, the reason being, in the beginning, I was using Canon, um, and I do know that, I mean, and I honestly, there are so many images that I've taken with my Canon that I absolutely love, but because of the limitation of the gear, now obviously I, I can see those technical flaws that, um, and those were obviously different type of cam, or like older Canon cameras <coughs> that I, um, I sort of compare with with those images and, I, and I'm thinking like, well, I wish I had this gear at the time. So I switched, uh, I think maybe six, seven years ago, I switched to medium format because I enjoy how images come up, uh, the technical aspect of a dynamic range, just like what you can do with the camera as a tool when you know what you're doing. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and have been shooting with Pentax. And um, and then the, the Fujifilm JFX came out 50S. So I switched to, to, to that. And um, I think I photographed with, with JFX for like a year, tagging Fujifilm <laughs> on Instagram and, 
basically trying to show them my work and then they noticed me and made me the ambassador. So Fuji, my, my love for Fujifilm came first. Okay. So uh, there, uh, at this moment, I would like, uh, if participants have a question, uh, please put it in my chat box. Otherwise, we proceed to the uh, next part of the session, which is wedding. Uh, if you have questions, please, please feel free uh, to... Or you can always raise the question at the end of the talk. So I think, Anna, I think uh, we can go to the next section. Okay. Let's see if it's supposed to. Oh. I will pause it here. So, um, one, one of the quotes that resonated with me um, was Annie Leibovitz. And I guess, I guess the, the, that comes to, um, to mind as well because. I always tried to like, um, like I said in the beginning, like I always put people first. Um, and I and when I photograph, I basically, without kind of knowing yet about it, I, I realized that I was falling in love with every every subject that I had. And there's no other way because you need to connect with the person, you need to to develop certain feelings, um, and you need to you know, photograph with your heart. And that's what I do, um, just putting like all my soul in it and and connecting deeply to the subject, then produce an image that will be full of, you know, full of, full of emotions and kind of will be representation of, of the person as well, because everybody is different. So in photographs, even though they are interpretation, my interpretation of the person, and I do have my own um, style to put it that way. Um, at the same time, they are all very um, couples that I photograph, people that I photograph. You know, they always have very different um, different dynamics in, in their relationships, for example, um, or what what's on the mind of a certain person. So I always thought that um, you you have to, as a photographer, you have to. Um, to try and, and make people um, show all those emotions. And then when I saw this in any labor it's quote about uh, falling in love, I thought, well, this is, <laughs> this is exactly how I feel um, about my subjects. So I'll show you a couple of, um, couple of my lens, a uh, couple of my wedding um, images. Um, You'll see a lot of black and white um, images as well, and and I and again, like I always try to tell a story, even if it's a story of a couple. So it's not um, there is environment, you know, there is a there is a location, there is a, a you know certain depth to to it, like like the image. There is a landscape. Um, there are certain. Um, there's a poetry, you know, in, in, in this kind of shots because, you know, it shows the dress and how it feels, <laughs> not just um, what it looked. And um, I do love architectural elements, um, natural elements, and just making it all kind of more interesting, uh, although emotional. And always trying to to make the short so to to plan it in, in in my head and then make it happen lots of happy couples uh, backlit shorts more of a silhouette shorts um and a couple of things um i wanted to talk about is um uh, like how, how I achieve, um, you know, certain images. So first one is, um, is obviously um, 
you know, because it's my interpretation, but at the same time, um, what I really try to achieve is to connect, to connect really with my subject. So they are just, um, you can just feel almost can imagine what the person was thinking and it makes you wonder what is this bride thinking, you know, on the morning of her wedding, for example, at different, different times. So connection is extremely important. Then um, telling a story. So this was a, <clears throat> this was a Pakistani bride. Um, it was a few years ago. And um, I basically, I was trying to take a shot um, of her. Um, usually when, usually when you try to take a portrait of somebody and the portrait that would be uh, deep and meaningful, um, you, you know, people start to overthink it and uh, you, you can't really take a good shot very often uh, because it's not really a true representation of, of, of a person. So I, I, I made a couple of attempts uh, of this bride and couldn't, couldn't achieve something that I was looking for. And then suddenly I came, like in that tradition, so the groom comes to the bride's house and she's waiting for him there. And they obviously, they don't live together before um, majority of those marriages were I arranged and this one was arranged as well. Um, they did see each other before uh, a few times, but at the same time, it's not like we have in Australia when a couple might be together for many years, um, they can all, some, some of them already have children together, you know, and then a, a wedding day becomes a celebration, uh, a party, put it that way. Um, in, in their tradition, it is a very big step. It's obviously a young girl moving away from her parents, from her parents' house. Uh, it is unknown. Um, so there is a lot of depth um, in, in, in the thought of the person, I was just, uh, and I, that's what I was trying to achieve, to kind of uh, interpret what she was going through at that moment. And then I kept like, and I basically saw her sitting against, um, against the white wall in her bedroom um, and waiting for the groom. And all these uh, thoughts, I guess, were going through her mind. And then I, um, I immediately thought this is it because she didn't know I was taking a shot of her. And then I transformed it into high key um, black and white photo. Um, so this, this shot won um, silver distinction on WPPI a couple of years ago. And um, I really like it because it's, it's basically, <laughs> it is again telling a story um, from a simple, simple setup, natural light as well. Um, that anybody can achieve. Um, this shot was taken in Tokyo. Um, again, um, there is a story to it. So obviously <clears throat> I wanted to interpret how a couple found each other um, in a busy Tokyo. I mean, they, they, um, they love traveling and we traveled there together uh, for the cherry blossom season. And I wanted to, to create basically to incorporate the the long exposure technique to show how how busy the city is and the life around them but then they obviously just have eyes for each other and the moment um, just freezes for them um, another shot of a bride on on the beach so um when i first was thinking about it like i, I was look well, you know you can photograph a, a bride on the beach you know there's not much to it but then when you incorporate an element like um a photojournalistic element, like for example, a, a, a surfer in the shot that immediately gives you a sense of space, a story um, and more depth to it. Um, again, a, a wedding, you know, couple, they're not posing. Um, I just made them, you know, work, enjoy themselves near the chapel where they got married and just to, to take a shot that uh, makes you think what are they talking about you know who are they and um, tells a story as well a mother helping helping her daughter before the wedding ceremony um, at the church entrance um, this this was a this was a, a, a story of, of a girl 
who basically you you, you just uh, you stop thinking she's very confident and she's looking outside and um, you know who is she she's she's herself but what's on her mind what is she thinking about you know again um, there's some story some story to it and another thing I really like doing is doing creative shots which is again um, it's it's never a composite uh, but it's always um, trying to find some elements that would complement I guess the the couple the scene um, maybe architectural element um, here for example against the window in in the church that I found I, I found it to be interesting this one was taken um, on a very rainy day so the sky was just white um, and I found this um, this staircase in in the venue that was just it, it basically was a race course and um, and I asked and, and couple was a little bit disappointed at first because it was raining you know they were like well what can we do with our photos um, there's not much of this that we can achieve and then I saw this uh, this staircase um, and I immediately, because it was against the, the white sky, you know, cl cl cloudy, cloudy sky. Uh, and I thought, well, this could be interesting. Obviously they are sheltered uh, from the rain. And I thought, but that could be an interesting black and white shot, like more dramatic. And then when I took it and I showed them later, and obviously once I processed it and made it black and white and um, removed everything unnecessary that was um, around, they, they said they, they were really glad it was raining so we could achieve something more unique. Um, not like what everybody was doing at, at, um, at that venue. Um, this is another short. Um, so this was a ballerina that I decided to photograph um, in, in the designer gown. So I was collaborating with the, design, with the, with the bridal, bridal designer. So this is a blue bridal dress. And I was thinking, well, I really want to photograph uh, a ballerina in the dress. And um, they, this is a little bit more about um, a vision or what you can what you can imagine and then make a reality. So this is this was actually um, a hotel where I photographed like a week before. Um, and um, I'll show you next slide. So on the right, you can see what actually this looks like. Um, to to people usually, and it's all about imagining it. So this is a foyer uh, on one of the floors in the hotel, and I saw the skylight, and I thought this would and in specific time of the day, the sun just go through this skylight and uh, creates this beautiful pattern on the, on the floor. And I was thinking like that would be such a beautiful natural light, you know, coming through. What can I do with it? Um, and then my vision kind of came together with the ballerina, you know, asking to make a specific move and obviously then eliminating all the um, destructing unnecessary elements, making into the shot on the left. Anna, if I may stop you. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you know, we have seen some stunning uh, wedding photography images now. And, uh, what I could say from my experience in, in India, the Indian weddings, the, the biggest problem is to get hold of the bride and the groom to create images like this. Whereas I think uh, in, in Western world or Australia and other countries, uh, the, the couple is more interested in creative shots or shots which they would use for for rest of their life, you know, and obviously uh, these shots are taken uh, probably a couple of days before, uh, and they allow you enough time. Um, they discuss with you. So how how does it go? Do you do that, or how is it done? Um, well, usually, well, when I because. I obviously have specific vision and specific approach uh, to photography, and that's like there, there are so many different uh, wedding photographers. You know, and each each one has their own style, and my my style is very much fine art, which is um, creating the moment uh, because I do I do have a vision. Um, once once I speak to the couple, 
uh, when we have like our initial consultation before they even book me, <clears throat> I speak to them like about their values, what, what they value in photography, what, what's more important to them in their wedding day, what the location is, what, what they are about, you know, and during that conversation is when I make a decision if these are the right clients for me, because there are so many people who they just want to party. They want a photographer who would be just a photojournalist, um, a fly on the wall, who would just capture what, what's there. Um, and not of, like, very often it's not very, not very flattering. There are other, um, other people who really want, um, I'm not going to mention photographers who, who, who have that style, um, but, you know, photographers who really enjoy post-processing images and who really like posing um, every single element of the shot, I fall somewhere in between because I do, I do like staging the shot as a director, as a creative director of, of the image. But then I want the image to look flawless and, and kind of have that feeling, you know, this is what the couple, the bride, the groom, you know, that's what they were feeling in the moment. That's how they wanted it to be. Like this girl, for example, you know, I just let her be free with who she is and just go wild, you know, and just express herself. And that's what they want. That's what they really love. And when I when I have this conversation, conversation with, with the couple, you know, I, I realize that this is my couple. And if people don't really appreciate photography or artistic approach to photography or like say my approach to photography this is just not my client because I will never be I, I can do a good job for them and do exactly what they want but it's not going to satisfy and inspire me and as an artist I always want to be inspired whereas if I work with the couples I can connect with and who really appreciate this this approach we're going to create something really magical together that's going to stay in their family for generations so are we saying that at the time when you meet the couple for the first time or in a second meeting and you feel that this is not the couple that i want to be with or this is not my kind of couple or i'm not their kind of photographer would you decline would you decline the assignment yes I've done this plenty of times. Oh, really? Okay. Because, you know, I'm seeing from uh, different people in different countries, uh, there's kind of a red race to get the job by hook or crook. And this is where I think I admire, this is where uh, the strength of a really great photographer comes from. Like you just said, that if you don't feel comfortable, then you don't do the assignment. That's really, really appreciable. You know, it's... Well, I think it depends, uh, uh, Rajan, it depends if, if you are a commercial photographer in the aspect of you just come up to the job and this is the money earning only to you. You just click the button, you document what's there, you don't really put any thought into it often. Um, many of them complain, you know, because it's not what they love, whereas I, I love every second of it, you know, whatever I'm doing. And I consider myself being an artist and and I do want to, like, I treat every couple as an artistic assignment, so, so to speak. And I really want to be inspired and fulfilled and to be proud of what I produce. Like, to me, it's never, it's never a job. It's something like, yes, you get paid for, but that's not why I'm there, you know, <laughs> if it's I like, can it for free. <laughs> it's like saying that uh, these are not just simple clicks that each picture is a, is a work of art and you're an artist. That's what I would say. That's what I, uh, I, hope, I hope to achieve. Um, and I mean, many photographers, they do have a different approach and you know, there, there is a, any, any other job and it shows and uh, there are clients who only want that to be documented. Um, I put a lot of thought, uh, like I'm saying, I really want to create some sort of a, a, a movie, so to speak, for a, for a couple where I present, like once I speak to them and understand what they want, I present to them um, a story for their um, engagement shoot. I, pre I present a story for their wedding shoot. Um, if we can't achieve something for the wedding day, we can, you know, go on another day to different location and, and do this again. And basically create a movie for them where they can be 
who they feel they are as a couple, as individuals, and you, you know, and, and, and let that creativity flow and create this together with them as a, you know, as, a, as artistic collaboration rather than me just dictating something or couple just, uh, you know, standing somewhere. Here we are, you know, <laughs> it's not very inspiring. Great. Please go ahead. There's only a couple more slides um, just to show different um, different details. I do really like using panning um, for for shots like these. Um, panning is not usually something that is using for used for for wedding photography, but you know if you if you do want to create um, a mood, uh, show the movement, you know the bride is running. Um, then it certainly creates a, a very interesting um, and beautiful technique. This was um, this was the couple um, that I photographed in Tokyo. So this was their wedding day um, here in Australia. So I always think think like at night I really want to take some photos with um, you know obviously I have to use flash at night at the reception and. Um, it's never, never good fun with the, with the flash, um, to be honest. So always trying to find some sort of natural light, and um, always trying to create create a story as well, you know. So uh, they they had a it, it was winter, so they had they had fire going uh, for all the guests um, at the reception because it was outdoor um, outdoor reception and outdoor ceremony as well, and the fire was. Um, was burning, and then I I came to the I came to the fire, and I wanted to kind of move it a little bit, so move one of the wooden wooden logs in there. And um, as you know, when you move something in the fire, it starts sort of sparkling a little bit. So I thought, um, wow, that would be that would be quite interesting creative shot. So I asked uh, my husband, who was my assistant, to to help me move those uh, logs with, with the fire while I put the couple kind of behind it to basically use the natural light from the fire and create the first of all create a story because it was cold it was winter you know they were using um, fire to to warm up the guests but also to add something interesting to it which were like the the fire sparkles so this was also like one shot beautiful and uh, shot. very beautiful shot. and I thought it would be quite uh, interesting uh, way of telling a story. Um, then I do like incorporating um, landscape in my in my shots as well. There is there is one more, and I think this is this this is the last one. So this is uh, this is all I wanted to show today for the wedding portraiture. In, in, uh... In both the section, I say 10 out of 10. Uh, it's brilliant, <laughs> brilliant work and uh, amazing. Um, uh, I just, uh, while I'm waiting for participants to raise questions in the chat box, I would like to ask you some questions in the meantime. And the one comes is, you know, whenever we are talking to people, the tendency that I see now in India and also some other countries that people have moved to a Sony uh, camera because that camera shoots like a machine gun, like 17 shots uh, per second or thing like that. Of course, they've lost the control to choose the shot. So the creativity is probably resting somewhere else. But what made you choose? Because to shoot with a medium format and especially 100 megapixel, what made you choose that? Yeah, now, now I shoot with, with 100 megapixel, obviously. So because I have, I'm, I've never been, I've never been a photographer who was trying to fire as many shots as possible per second and then hoping to get something. I'm always about um, anticipating the moment. And I guess it comes with that connection with people, uh, with your subjects and with knowing, um, like obviously comes with experience because you know when certain things are happening and I, I am quite good at um, feeling people reading their body language and kind of like walking, walking with it. So I do like to, and, 
and I never want to be that photographer who just places their, their couples and say, every second, you know, I take a shot and I say, well, you, you put your arm here, you hug like this, you do this, and you constantly are in, in their space. And I also don't want to be the photographer who is very far away and just taking photo like, well, there's a rubbish bin at the background, you know, I don't care, the, the light is not flattering to them. That's how it was, you know, that's not me as an artist. I want to position um, a person, a couple in a very flattering scenery lighting where everything works for me and then give them suggestion on maybe uh, a couple of poses and, and, and things like that. And then let the magic unfold and let them be themselves. And that's where I can obviously capture, capture oh. beautiful. So my, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, so my short is always intentional, which means, and always anticipated because I know when things will happen. So that's why I don't need that point and shoot extra fast camera to click that button. And I just know, because I know when the moment will happen. So I can treat it with a slower camera that I know will produce a, a better photograph. And I don't need to have a, a 10,000 of them that I will hope there is a couple I can use in between. I can just have one shot that will, will be perfect. And the reason why I'm using, um, so first of all, medium format, obviously, not quite often you see them used for wedding photography because they are quite difficult. Uh, and I guess it's all a matter of like the way you shoot, you know, what your style is, but it's also a matter of learning for the camera to be like the extension of your hand to, to feel and to understand it and to know, to know your camera well, so you can make it work definitely. Um, I, I shoot dancing with it, I shoot at night, I shoot uh, in any, any types of light. And uh, one of the things that I offer to my couples is, um, because I photograph landscape, obviously, you know, and, and a, lot of, a lot of people, they choose, um, they choose allocation for a reason, you know, it can be a destination wedding, it can be a beautiful scenery, it can be something meaningful to them. So I offer um, a landscape shot where the couple is a main hero. Um, and a lot of them, they do like printing this um, in large, like say meter and a half long prints, um, because nobody likes to print in you know, a meter and a half long um, portraits, you know, <laughs> close up portraits is going to just be too much. But if you have, um, if you have a beautiful landscape shot of a location that you love where you are standing you know, with the partner and it's your, with your partner and it's your wedding day, it becomes something very special. Uh, and a lot of couples, they do really love that. So to be able to use um, a hundred megapixel camera, for example, allows me to print shots like this if necessary. Um, and another reason is because of wedding, wedding day is obviously such a, such a fast paced event. You know, it's not like always you have a plenty of time to, you know, to photograph couple in a certain way. So sometimes I want, um, a further away shot, I want a close up shot. And obviously I don't want to torture them be between uh, like switch lenses or switch cameras, you know, um, and do things like that. So I take one shot, say with my 45 millimeter lens, they can, I can later crop very flawlessly to become a, a cropped, a very tight portrait. So I can make two, maybe even three shots sometimes out of one picture without a couple even knowing about it. And because each shot is hundred megapixel, you know, it's going to be a beautiful resolution regardless. So that's like one of the technical advantages of using it, I suppose, in, in this kind of work. So may I just, uh, uh, if we take the screen sharing off, then I can bring you more in limelight and uh, bring you here. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, um, so the questions uh, that's also now coming up is, uh, you know, you are shooting with some fantastic lenses like 110 uh, and uh, the new 1.7, yeah, 80. Um, that being the that being the thing, I've seen your work. It doesn't have the harshness of uh, that very very crisp or, you know, let's say sharp uh, digital photography. 
Yeah. And at one point of time, I think I read about you and you mentioned the technique where you're trying to interpose uh, taking pictures with such high-end cameras and on the other hand, trying to make them look like as if they are shot with analog. So exactly. what's, the, what's the secret that, that uh, you have been doing? In, in Because these images surely speak of the work, which is, uh, I would say, away from digital photography. It's yeah, well, uh, I think that digital is not necessarily um, flattering to people. It, they, they just, uh, Digital cameras like uh, the you, like Sony you mentioned, you know they um, first of all like they oversaturate colors. So the, the color that comes out of the of the camera, uh, and many people that don't really realize that, and, and landscape photographers and wedding photographers, portrait photographers, you know, they don't realize that those colors they are not true to life. They're very like your your green grass will be like that neon neon green that is unnatural you know your blue sky will be like super contrasty and i've seen a lot of photographers they even over process not to mention all the filters that currently photographers are using make the skin orange um, and um, very kind of very moody so they so they call look which is not not true to reality at all um, so when i photograph i try to keep things real and obviously film photography, analog photography, you know, it's um, the closest thing there is. I do shoot um, with contacts um, on film. So if you used to use Fuji, Fuji 400 for, for film before it was discontinued earlier this year, now Kodak uh, Portra. And I do bring my film camera to, you know, personal projects and to weddings and photograph quite, quite a bit with it. Um, so what digital um, what did digital usually looks like is it is too contrasty, the colors are too vibrant. Um, and I think wedding, and I guess that the nature of my work as well, creating something you know more poetic, more romantic, uh, going back to the the topic of this conversation, I suppose, you know, to create something that is um, a little bit more ethereal, a little bit more whimsical rather than, just um, you know, straight, straight like a shot without any feeling to it. So um, I try to I try to reduce the digital part of of the shot. So I desaturate certain colors, um, for example, greens and blues. Um, I I work mostly on the skin tones to make sure that the skin tones are the most beautiful. Um, and I reduce um, the clarity clarity slider so it's not as sharp um, because nobody wants to see a portrait, you know, where everything is is very visible. You know, no bride would like to see that. Ask any woman. <laughs> they want to be, they, they still want a soft photograph. And I think that's kind of one of the things why um, analog film, film photography is quite popular, you know, still now between wedding photographers is because it makes the skin look beautiful. It makes it look smooth and um, very, very pleasing to the eye. Um, whereas um, digital, I think, is just overdoing it. It's, it's very harsh. So um, I, I use the clarity, clarity, contrast. Um, I reduce those ones, HSL sliders to, to change the color um, as well of the greens and blues. Um, I do add grain. Um, Sometimes, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, obviously, it depends how you photographed it. Like if you used uh, a higher ISO base, naturally it will have grain. So adding more will simply be, be any worse. And I, I guess you have to be careful as well because digital grain is not as pleasing as film grain. So you need to be very subtle. But if you do introduce um, a little bit of it, you won't be able to see it like if, if the like for example a lot of uh, a lot of images that I've shown today they have grain to them when you look at it from from further away you can't see it it's obviously not not a visible grain when you zoom into it you can see it but what it does it makes the edges softer and smoother and and gives you like a little bit different feeling 
yeah. from the image. Um, I guess a combination of all, all those things that I've mentioned. So that's um, that. That's just the way how I guess I I see. It. There's plenty of photographers who do like bumping the contrast. You know, they they like sharpness. They they want it all tuck sharp and. You know, there's obviously clients who appreciate that as well. So it's it's all for different people. So the transition between the DSLR or your previous camera, the 645, to a mirrorless, uh, how how was the transition? Because there are complaints, first of all, getting used to a mirrorless and focusing, and the focusing is slow. And how did you encounter that, especially at uh, wedding events? Well, definitely it was a learning curve, um, that's for sure, because weddings, you know, it, it is a very, very fast paced um, event, um, obviously. So you, you do have to, um, you, ha you have to know the camera um, and you, you need to practice with it. It's not like you're just, you know, showing up with a new camera at the wedding, you know, you need to practice enough um, but then I don't, because I have this approach of not, you know, firing multiple shots in a second and trying to get one and because my shot is actually intentional and I have film, um, film mentality. I mean, I guess because I started with film as well, you know, digital was much later for me. Um, I am from that generation, older generation. Um, and when, when you photograph film, and I guess that's something that um, more modern photographers, you know, they don't really think about it because you have your, you know, memory card and it's, you know, you have so much capacity then these days, you know, I remember when I had my first card, it was um, eight megabyte and it felt like it was yes. <laughs> crazy um, on my first digital camera. And, and, and now, you know, my cards are like five, five twelve um gigabyte and <laughs> one wedding will have to go through a couple of those for sure so it's it's definitely um you know things definitely changed but back then you know when you have a and, and even now you know for those who photograph film still you know that every single shot that you take with film counts because on context for example i have 16 shots you know mm -hmm. um it's always a hassle to obviously change the, change the film role, but I always have this mentality of, is this shot worth it? And it makes me revisit, um, revisit the image that I'm taking to maybe like, like to, to basically analyze it a bit more and maybe change something. And, and it's a constant process in my head, but like once you learn more that approach you become better and become sort of more more automatic because you can or if i just shuffle like a couple centimeters to one side it's going to be so much better and you learn that slow um observation i guess of of your surroundings of of your subjects uh and learning to anticipate that moment and then it's going to be worth pressing the button so the same approach i have with the digital camera um, and that's why I'm not really worried about the focus uh, because, because I'm intentional about it. And like I'm saying, like it, all cameras, they work perfectly um, in terms of the focus. You just need to know on what to focus, kind of feel, feel your camera and then practice with it and, and it all will come. So no fear. <laughs> how, how this story about... Uh the Fujifilm Global Ambassador came about because, you know, that's a great recognition. It was definitely, um, it was definitely um, a, a big, uh, an exciting accomplishment to me because uh, basically, <clears throat> basically the way it happened. Um, so like I'm saying, like I, I, I fell in love with the JFX and it was more modern than um, Pentax 645Z that I was using at the time. And uh, I thought, well, this is the camera for me. And, and Pentax, for example, it is a great camera, but it has so many limitations in terms of color rendering. It's also bigger, but it also has uh, limitations um, 
in 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 the color so i couldn't really use it for for wedding work so it was more of a just a tool to keep for the landscape photography and then i was thinking like well i can't justify to have just one camera you know for the landscape work and then a canon kit that i had at the time for for the wedding work um just too many too many things and then every time i was trying to bring my pen text to the wedding uh try to take some portraits never liked the outcome of it <coughs> and then um jfx came out and i thought well this seems like a good round round up camera to and it was 50s to to use for both so i tested it um because i i, I happened to be an ambassador for for it a photography stores chain in Australia as well so they were kind to me to to let me to, to let me test it and I really liked it and then purchased it um yeah so 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 I started like using it and then taking some photos that was landscape photos wedding photos and then as I was saying like I I have uh, on my Instagram, I was just tagging Fujifilm and like, hey, <laughs> this is me. Because <laughs> uh, you need to, like, you, you can't just expect that, you know, somebody will just knock your door yeah. without knowing you. You know, you kind of have to tell people that you exist, but also work hard for it. You know, it's not just like, oh, hey, make me your ambassador. And I, I know there's so many, so many photographers I came across um, here in Australia, for example, they say, well, if some if a brand wants to make me the ambassador, you know they have to send me free gear. Um, they um, or they say they say something is good not because they really think that way, feel that way, but just because they're sponsored. I have way too much integrity to, you know, to be that way. So if I and and I am sponsored by a few brands um, these days, but every single one of them is something I truly believe in. And you know, and so many people come to me with questions about Fujifilm, and often I say, well, if you and they ask asking like, hey, like I'm between choosing Sony and choosing Fujifilm, I never say, and 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 anybody who's spoken ever to me will 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 tell that like I never say or to go for Fujifilm, you know, like a salesperson, just because I'm the ambassador to the brand, you know, I use it because it works for me. And I can tell you about the reasons why I like it, and why it works, but you make your own decision based on what you like, because other like, other reason is, um, every camera has different uh, menus, it has a different ergonomics, you know, and every person is different. Obviously, we all wired differently mentally. Um, hands are all different you know so what works for me might be very uncomfortable to use for someone else same as like what sure. another person is using like i couldn't use some other brands for example you know and if you have to use your camera and you constantly uh, have frustrations with the menu for example how easy it is to navigate certain buttons and get to certain things at the end of the day you're going to get so frustrated you're going to put it on the shelf and are going to take photos whereas the, pur the purpose is to be inspired with the camera you have whichever camera it is so you can go and shoot an experiment um so yeah and um long story short basically they they contacted me saying like well um how we we're very interested in in your work because we don't see often female photographers uh these days they were mostly male photographers just the way I guess how things were and um, they were very surprised to, to see uh, to see a female photographer and they were like we've never seen a photographer who does landscape and wedding <laughs> so oh. just a, um, a, a, a whole package to them like really interesting and um, we started basically collaborating a little bit more um, they invited me so that there is a photography show called snap happy on channel 10 it's like one of national channels in australia so they invited me to to film me for two days um, <coughs> and um, show landscape work and uh, and wedding work and it's basically like a a television tv episode about me uh, that went for half an hour um, Peter Eastway was actually there as well. Yes. And <laughs> He's coming up very soon. He's on coming up. 
Yeah, so yeah, it was a great honor and obviously to see my face, you know, on national television for, for my minutes of fame, I suppose. Um, so we, we've done that and had like really, a really good rating and had a good, good response. And I guess for, for Fujifilm, one of the biggest things as well is what the photographer stands for, like the philosophy uh, of the photographer, the philosophy of your, of your work. Um, not being that person like, oh, you just give me that gear and, you know, gonna tell everybody how, how good it is. So it's like a lot of integrity, all those things. And then, um, so we've done the show. Um, I wrote a couple of articles uh, for, for, for Peter Eastway, for example, the interview, a um, couple more things. And then after that, probably it was a year, almost, maybe nine, eight, nine months um, when the head of Fujifilm Australia. So he called me and said that um, headquarters in Japan decided to, to make me global ambassador. So I did my happy, oh, happy dance. <laughs> wow. Yeah, wow. but it was, wow. um, it was again, I mean, it, it, it was a, it was incredible. Um, but at the same time, they, they did kind of test, test me in different aspects of uh, what I can do. So it's, it's work how I behave in different situations. And when we were filming, you know, two days of filming, we 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 traveled together on location, spent night together, you know, in, in accommodation. So you get to know people. So all these aspects, they kind of, I guess, play, play their role because they get to know you as a person. And that's because what's important is the person behind the camera, not the camera. Yeah, of course. So what would you say the most difficult moments of your life in wedding photography? in wedding photography. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you recall any? There were a few. Um, and I guess that, that that all comes with the experience as well. Um, the, the hardest wedding that I photographed was of that Pakistani bride that I showed the portrait of. But that was fantastic and amazing portrait. Thank it you. It was a beautiful, you know. It, 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 was, um, it was 600 people wedding. And I was the only photographer, and uh, I guess um, I guess it all came like it was quite early on in my wedding photographer career, um, and I simply didn't know like before that I photographed say Australian weddings, and usually Australian weddings you know you have maybe um, hundred, uh, between eighteen hundred twenty people I'd say yeah like roughly. Um, they never, like, they always want to have, um, you know, family portraits, photos together, you know, different parts of the wedding. And it kind of um, is always the same, mostly. Uh, whereas with this wedding, like, you know, it was very exciting. So we had two days, there was a henna night, there was, um, there was an engagement, there was the wedding. Um, it was uh, very, very culturally interesting to me. Uh, what I didn't know is that they would have 600 people. They had 56 tables, I think, at the reception. So I was told, hey, can you photograph every single table with guests at the wedding? I'm like, sure, no problem. Like I always do, right? In the, every wedding I go through, through all the tables. At the time, I didn't have assistant, which is now my husband, for example. And um, or sometimes I have a um, a, a third photographer even helping like when when the couple needs it um anyway so I didn't know and I come to the reception space and I see uh, not not to mention that was uh, in uh, early February and we had 38 degrees um wow. whereas as a photographer first of all you wear black um you, like you have to you, you're working, whereas like the bride, she was, um, first of all, she was covered. She was really hot. She was dehydrated. It was really hard for her. But at the same time, she's the bride. So she would be saying like, hey, I want to sit down in the shade. I want to have a, you know, water. I want to have a break. That's fine. Whereas for me, I can't do that because I'm working. If I'm dead, you know, I still have to be working. <laughs> and and it, it, that's just the way how I am as well, because I'm there for for them you know it's not time to have a break so we like it was a challenging day uh, physically during the day and then I arrived to the reception and I see how many tables were there so that was one thing obviously I had to go through it for all tables and take individual groups of people so imagine 600 guests uh, that that adds up pretty quickly um, and then in their tradition um, they like all guests 
line up um, to give gifts to the couple. Um, and they basically, the couple is on the stage. So I had to be standing in front of the stage with like, because I'm, I'm not as, as tall. Um, so I had to stand with my camera like up with the screen down so I could see obviously what's on, on the screen, standing like this. And then, and there's an echo, hey, can you take photos when, um, when guests are giving them gifts? Like it, 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 it was like jewelry or uh, all those things. I'm like, yeah, for sure. Like I just gonna stand, <coughs> take those photos. And then I see 600 people from two sides lining up to the stage. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> so I was there like with my hands in the air and they had to do this twice for different type because one was giving the gift, the second, I don't remember what exactly the reason was. Um, there was some, some sort of ceremony, but basically all these guests went twice. And I've been standing with my arms like in the air in the same position for probably two, two and a half hours. Wow. And I remember like at the end, so first of all, like my, my arms were so sore, um, but I remember my, like my hands were not even working properly because I was trying to press the button and they were just shaking, but I was just like holding it in there. So it was just physically very, very challenging. Uh, and they finished at one o'clock at the morning. So it was, was really very bad. usual of uh, Asian weddings, very usual. Yeah. There's, no, usually, there's no time limit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But when, when, you have, uh, when you have experience with these sort of things, you obviously have, you know, a couple of shooters helping you. I know that some of these photographers, they have, say, a main photographer working through the day uh, for the main part of the, the more uh, you know more important events and you have another photographer joining for the reception one yeah. will cover just the tables another will will cover for example those guests so he would be maybe he or she would be on maybe elevation of some sort you know with a tripod because i didn't have that and be set up so they could actually take those photos because it's not as difficult you know it's just the challenge of having your arms in the air for for such a long time and um, and then the main photographer would just stay, you know, maybe take take some other photos. So it, now when I have a, a meeting with a couple, how many guests? What exactly do you want? With this? How many? If you, I, anybody going to be lining up um, for for the for the questionnaire, as we say? <laughs> it, 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 it just basically has happened just simply because I had no experience yes. um, and I had to face this, you know, learn this the hard way. But that's fine, you know. I I loved it. Um, I think I couldn't lift my arms probably for a couple of days after, and I couldn't get up from the bed. So we have the trustee of uh, RPS with us today, Dr. Avijit Datta, and he is raising a question. Anastasia, where do you go from here? <laughs> creatively, creatively, where do you go from here? You don't mean too too bad, you know. Have uh, no, 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 no. Where do you go from here creatively? Um, well, I guess, uh, I guess, like I mentioned before, like I have so many ideas, so many projects, uh, you know, with the landscape photography. Um, you know, few workshops um, that I was planning in Europe, for example, and few really exciting trips um, to Greenland, to Iceland, in different seasons. Come back to Japan. I really enjoyed it over there. Um, there's a few uh, in northern Norway, for example. Um, I really love photographing uh, nature and uh, wildlife. Um, Africa, you know, there's so many places that I'm so excited about. And unfortunately, well, Australia is closed, um, if you guys know. So we have a strict um, no, no entry, no leaving. Um, so how, how do you manage in this pandemic? What happened to the photography because wedding photography is no no traveling is no no so how did you spend your time it has been quiet uh, obviously we had um, we had one wedding last year and um, it was postponed and literally we had a we had a lockdown and we had two two weeks and because the the couple had um because we we have state waters in australia yes the couple, couple was getting married interstate Yes. Not too far from us, but still interstate. So 
we we were waiting for the borders to open and it's all uncertainty now it's going to go ahead because can we go there can't we go there mm -hmm. and then the borders open we had the wedding and then two weeks later we not even two weeks later the borders shut again and we were like well yeah we did it but they postponed say from july to to november this this year um I was supposed to be at the moment in Europe because we had weddings in Scotland, in Italy, in Paris, um, all this ex really exciting destination weddings, uh, American couples, most of them. And um, they were postponed from last year <laughs> to this year with the conversation. I was like, well, surely this year can go ahead and um, couldn't. Obviously, so it has been has been challenging for for them for me because you know they could be put it that way like a, a dream wedding that you really want to photograph and very exciting because I do love traveling yes. and it's very inspiring to me but you know I'm, I'm keeping the hopes up obviously you know the board isn't going to be shut forever uh, hopefully we get through the pandemic and you know just to try to focus on you know being grateful for for what we have that we're safe here you know our loved ones and just you know invest in that energy and that focus into the family into maybe um <coughs> rethinking certain aspects of the business um you know like for example i've been working on redesigning my site um website doing certain things on social media maybe um taking the time to kind of slow down and think what do i do next um as an artist like what is my style with the with the wedding photography because you often see, um, you, you get so caught up sometimes in the commercial part of it because you get booked and then it's just like nonstop, nonstop. And some like in the past, I've been taking maybe 40 weddings um, a year, whereas now I only take about 15, um, maybe 20 if they ask too much, but I say no to a lot of people. Um, going back to <laughs> previous conversation. And it's, it's, it's very much, um, it comes from that philosophy of uh, of the photographer of the artist so it's a good time it has been a good time last year and this year to basically you know pause for a little bit and think who is my ideal client who are those people i really want to spend because we like we only have one life and i'm putting so much energy and, and effort into every wedding i want to i want to enjoy it as well myself yes want to be appreciated as a as an artist i want to be appreciated as a you know person photographing their wedding not just like well we just want whoever is the cheapest you know i don't really like that approach there's always going to be somebody cheaper anyway and, and uh, i don't know how to express my deep gratitude it's been an honor to have you on the show here with us today. You've been wonderful. You've been very cooperative. We have seen probably very amazing stuff, very amazing portfolio both. And it's, it's very rare that I've seen a landscape come bedding photographer and that also a female. So I think incredible. It was a great honor to have you with us today. And on behalf of the Royal Photographic Society, I. Thank you. I say immensely grateful to you for being with us, especially considering that far away in Brisbane, you are almost burning the midnight all to be with us, you know, um, keeping us entertained and, you know, uh, having a look at your fantastic portfolio. So thank you really for everything this evening. And I wish you a pleasant weekend and keep safe and keep well. And I, I'm sure that the kind of photography that I've seen is going to take you much, much further than I, have, I can ever imagine. So my good wishes are always there. We will keep in touch. And maybe sooner or later, I will buzz you again that we want <laughs> you back on our show. Of course, Rajan. Thank you so much for, yeah. for, for having me. Like It has been a great honor yeah. um, for, for being invited and obviously share my story and, and my work. And I'm, um, I'm so grateful that you know so many people were interested in in seeing um, my my work and you know hearing hearing the story that I have to tell. And I guess um, as creatives, um, as photographers, you know we always have to have that purpose 
you know, why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, and it's always, you know, giving back. So giving back to, um, to the society. So giving back to people, um, inspiring them, helping them, you know, supporting them on, on the stages of, of their journey, you know, uh, whether it being inspiring with your work or with just kind words. Um, giving back through, you know, different charities and, you know, helping, helping su support the environment with, with your work and contribute to, to different causes. I guess it's also very important. Um, that's something I, I feel very passionate about. Um, not just, you know, going into national park and, and walking for, you know, restricted paths just to get the shot. I, I don't want to do the wrong thing. And I know that many photographers do that and then they post it on social media then tourists come and like oh where did they take this from and then they venture in some locations that uh, should not be ventured to like that uh, environment um, for wildlife um, for the, the, the biodiversity you know so it has a we we have a lot of impact on everything we do and we have to to have a lot of um, you know integrity about everything we're doing and everything like not just, oh, I just want to take this shot, you know, or even the way how you treat um, your subject, like the couple, for example, you know, I just want to take this photo for my portfolio. There's still real people in front of you and they have places to be, you know, they might be uncomfortable with certain things that you're saying. Sometimes they just, you know, people just photographers push for certain um, creative vision, uh, putting couples in danger without sort of thinking through. Um, often or making them uncomfortable you know you always have to put um, set your priorities properly like whether it be nature um, or, or people and just being very respectful of that so that's what we always have to always remember is well, thank you so much and um, I as much as we want to continue and see more images but uh, <laughs> we have to conclude this session for today on uh, thank you. yeah Thank you once again for everything. Wish you a very, very uh, great weekend. Thank you, you too, Rajan. Bye, bye. Thanks everyone for joining. Good bye. night. Good night. Or good day. <laughs>